It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to the cleverly titled The Phil Ferguson Show. I'm so glad that you're here. This is a different kind of episode, and I just wanted to start by telling patrons uh, that you are not being charged uh, for this show because I think this is outside of the normal expectations. Anyone that is kicking in one, three, five, or even $6.66 are expecting from my podcast. This is indeed 100% about bed bugs. If you don't give a flying fuck about bed bugs, if you get weirded out talking about insects that can suck your blood, skip it. I don't care. I mean, I do care. I think it's kind of interesting anyway, but you know, you have a busy life. If you don't want to learn about bed bugs, if you don't want to know about bed bugs, go ahead, skip this episode. It's going to be okay. However, I want this show to stand alone on its own, which I guess is what standing alone means, uh, for anyone out there that who may not even be a regular listener, never heard of the show before, can find it and get some benefit. Uh, I do have an interview with Chris Dietrich, and he is an entomologist at the University of Illinois, and he was kind enough to give us a lot of basics about bed bugs, what they are, what they look like, how they live, where they hide, how they eat, stuff like that. So that's very educational. And then after that, I do what I call in the follow-up to that interview, where I will go over how you actually get rid of bed bugs. And it's a weird thing, but because of some interesting parts of my reality, uh, I was involved with a situation where I helped someone eliminate bed bugs it's not me, it's not my wife, it's not my kids, we're fine, um, but it is someone I know, um, and it's not a cleanliness issue, it's just a bed bug issue, but you know, if you're kind of fascinated about how they live and how, how they die, you're going to love this episode. If you have bed bugs, you're going to really love this episode, especially the ending part, but again, since this is so different, patrons will not be charged, and I do thank you for that. If you ever hear or see of somebody that has a bed bug problem, feel free to share this show far and wide. It is really, truly meant as a public service. Um, actually, kind of like a lot of my investment things do. Anyway, we've got more investing topics coming up in following shows, more interviews uh, to be scheduled for following shows. So I'm going to cut this intro short uh, again because it's so different and it's going to be all about bed bugs. All right, everybody, welcome back. I have Chris Dietrich. He is a entomologist at the University of Illinois in the Illinois Natural History Survey. Uh, Chris, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. Excellent. Did I get all that title and location and organization correct? Yes, perfect. And do you teach at the University of Illinois? I do occasionally, but mostly I just do research and I work with graduate students. Excellent. What is your specific area of research? I'm curious. So my my main interest is in insect evolution. I'm interested in... Um, a particular group called leafhoppers. They're a group of uh, plant-feeding insects that, that uh, suck the sand out of plants. A lot of them are uh, economically important. They're agricultural pests. Some of them spread plant diseases. Um, but I'm mostly interested in coming up with ways to classify them, identify them, uh, discover all the diversity 
that is out there. Um, we're still finding new species all, all the time, uh, especially in tropical regions of the world. Um, and so I do a lot of field work in various countries, trying to uh, get out and, and collect specimens, bring them back, study them, uh, extract their DNA, look, look at their relationships to each other in terms of uh, um, their phylogeny, their evolution. They're basically the tree of life. Um, and... Um, yeah, I, I train students. We look we look at um, a lot of different aspects of insect ecology and evolution and behavior and that sort of thing. So. That is fantastic. From time to time, I have had um, some evolutionary biologists and paleontologists and stuff on the show. So uh, you're in good company, and I, I see here that uh, there's some things that you have published, of course. Uh, anything in particular you recommend if people want to know more about your specific specialty? Well, let's see. I guess uh, there probably are. There's a there's an encyclopedia of insects that I had. I wrote a chapter for. Um, that's widely available. Um, most of my publications are in the scientific literature. Right. And a lot of them are, are hey. pretty esoteric. So, um, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily recommend them to a general reader. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, you can find my publications if you just go on Google Scholar and type in the word leafhopper and then my last name. And the last name for the listeners is Dietrich, D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H. Excellent. I wanted to get some of that stuff out of the way. And you are apparently the person who got suckered, convinced, uh, talked into, or you just are really kind to me and volunteered from the University of Illinois to talk a little bit about bed bugs. Yes. Excellent. Uh, t I know you had a pre-show a little disclaimer that uh, you were not doing research on them, so we'll take that with a grain of salt. But what is it that you know about bed bugs and how do we deal with them in our world? Well, so I... I I'm familiar with them. They're actually related to the group that I work on. Um, they um, basically feed in a similar way. The, work, the bugs I work on, these hoppers feed on plants, and they have what, what are called piercing, sucking mouth parts, which basically means they have a little tube that they stick into the whatever the food it is that they want to eat. Yeah, and they suck. They basically suck up liquid food and in the case of bed bugs it's uh, basically the same kind of mouth parts as a leaf hopper but it's uh, they instead of sucking plant sap they suck human and other kind of animal blood um, so that's where it becomes a problem they're they're kind of a, a pest of humans a lot of them are um, <clears throat> sort of found all over the world. They're, they're associated with warm-blooded hosts, basically, that um, that nest and humans fall into that category. So there are a lot of, a lot of other related insects related to bed bugs that feed on things like birds and um, bat, bats, for example. Um, so it's kind of the same. It was kind of a natural evolutionary leap for the bed bugs to the ancestors of the human bed bug to sort of jump from one warm-blooded host to another right and that's that's where they became a problem for us uh do you happen to know the the life cycle of bed bugs what what are the, like different stages yeah so they, they have a very simple life cycle unlike a lot of other insects which go through um, a distinct egg pupa or egg larva pupa and adult stage. Bed bugs basically start with the egg and then they go through five nymphal stages and the nymphs are basically just the smaller versions of the adult. They look about the same as the adult, unlike, uh, you know, for example, a, a butterfly has a caterpillar that right. looks like a worm, which is nothing like the adult in appearance. So the uh, the bed bug babies basically look just like the adults. They're just smaller. So as they grow, as they feed, um, they have to grow and they 
shed their exoskeleton, and they basically um, do that five times until they reach the adult stage. Now, do you happen to know, um, I'm assuming that the little ones, the babies, are able to feed themselves, or do they need parental help? Yeah, no, they, um, unlike some other related bugs um, that do have parental care, um, some stink bugs, for example, um, bed bugs are basically on their own. Once they, once they hatch, the, the babies, the nymphs, we call them, actually just they're out wandering around on their own looking for something to eat, and they eat the same thing as, as the adults, <laughs> which is human blood. Awesome. And, and how long is this life cycle from being laid as an egg to being a full adult? So it, it really depends. It kind of depends on the specific conditions. Uh, uh, the temperature is a big factor. Um, so they can actually reach the adult stage in, in a month under ideal conditions. Um, but generally it takes, takes a bit longer than that. Excellent. Uh, one of the things I happen to know about bed bugs is that different stages, maybe a little bit different colors. Can you go over that for us so we know what to look for? Well, yeah. So the nymphs are, tend to be paler than the adults, and this is true of, of most uh, related insects too. Um, but after they've had a blood meal, they basically all have the same kind of rusty reddish color. And the, and the eggs are white, is that correct? Yeah, the eggs are white. They're extremely small, you know, about the size of a pinhead. Um, so difficult to see, but yeah, they're they're white. And they're laid in clusters, usually maybe two to five eggs in a cluster. Um, and a, fe- a single female can lay up to maybe 100 or 200 eggs <laughs> over the course of her, her life. Yeah, and, and how, how long is an adult life? Well, the adults can live, typically they live just a a couple of months as adults. Um, You know, once once they reach the adult stage, males and females try to find each other and they mate. Um, And then the females will go off and have one or more additional blood meals and um, find a place to hide. While the eggs mature, then she'll go around and and, uh, lay her eggs. Um, but the, the males, actually, they have this really interesting way of having sex. Basically, the males, instead of um, uh, inserting the, the intermittent organ into the genital tract of the female, they actually just pierce the abdomen of the female directly, and that causes, obviously, some trauma to the female. Right. Usually, it doesn't kill the female directly, but it, um, you know, it can... Uh, occasionally cause, you know, shortening of the life of the female. Um, I but, did not. Yeah, that's that's kind of a u- unusual aspect. Yeah, I, I did not know that Behavior, part. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic, because of course, yeah, if it's it... Called, it's called traumatic insemination. Wow, because if it killed Which them at a basically high... basically what it is. Yeah, if it killed them at a high ratio, it would kind of evolve them out. <laughs> yeah, it's not, you would think it's not... Um, uh, adaptive, um, but apparently what happened was that you know males males compete for females and they compete to be the first one to inseminate the eggs. And because the ovaries are kind of in the middle of the abdomen, um, I guess there was at some point a uh, selection for the males to actually directly inseminate the ovaries instead of you know inserting the the uh, Venus into the yeah. genital tract of the female, where the sperm would actually have to travel quite and, a bit and, and you said further to get to the eggs. More than a hundred eggs over the lifetime. How many might they lay at any given moment? Yeah, like so a dozen any, or something. Any given moment, um, usually they lay a cluster of two or five at a time. But the female can do that multiple times. You know, they, she might have you know, 10 or 12 eggs in the abdomen that are mature at one time. And so she might lay a couple of different clusters before she then has to go and feed again and um, wait for additional eggs to develop. Excellent. And and the eggs are bright white and they're quite small, uh, bigger than your normal table salt, I think, but uh, not much bigger. Does that sound right? 
Yeah, that's right. They're really difficult to see. Yeah, I mean, they're they're much. These are very small insects to begin with. The uh, adults are typically only about a, a quarter of an inch long. Right. Um, and so the eggs are proportionally pretty small compared it, to, like, a, for example, a stink bug, which yeah. is a related group. But but you can you can see them if you pause and carefully pay attention to an, yeah, an infected area. Yeah, if you know where to look for them, um, and you're very careful, and you know look very carefully, it is possible to spot them. Now, how do they find humans? I mean, I, I get that they are hungry and they want to find food. How do they locate the food? Yeah, so just like other blood feeding organisms, they they key in on certain aspects of the, the host smell. Um, carbon carbon dioxide is one thing that attracts them. You know, as you exhale, you, you're expelling CO2, and so they're attracted to that, just like mosquitoes are. Um, the warmth of, the, of your body is another thing that, that they key in on, um, and they, you know, they probably can... Um, detect certain other smells of the host, just the body odors and so forth. Nice. They they have very sensitive antennae that have little tiny sensory organs on them that that detect different different aspects of the the host's character. Uh, I understand. So as long as we uh, don't breathe out carbon dioxide, we'd be better off. Oh, that's not going to work, is it? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um. Another thing is that uh, I think it's kind of a, an unusual thing, but when bed bugs bite, it's almost always in a straight line, and they bite multiple times. Is that your understanding? Yeah, typically what you see is a line of bites, and basically it's right along where the person, the host, is laying on the bed at the time that the bed bug is doing its thing. So, you know, they don't. They don't really like to climb up on the host. Um, basically, they just sort of crawl across the bed, and, and once they encounter bare skin, um, they stick their mouth parts in there and take a, take a blood meal. Yeah, because w- one of the things I learned is that they'll crawl along the bed and, like you said, not climb on the host. And do they bite again and again and again, and that's how you get the line? Because they can't get it all in one go? Is that... Yeah, they typically, you know, because your, um, you know, your immune system kicks in, your um, your blood starts to coagulate, and so sometimes they have to, you know, pierce the skin multiple times. Well, one to, to find a good blood vessel for one thing, and yeah. another just just to get additional blood, um, you know, before they're satiated, and then they. Once they're once they're full, then they go crawl off and find a place to hide. And they won't feed again for three to seven days, typically. And, after and that, I assume hiding is somewhere out of the light, somewhere in a corner or a confined space where they might be a little bit harder to find. Yeah, typically they they like this. They're very flat insects, and so they typically like to kind of squeeze into little cracks and crevices either in the bed frame um you know inside the mattress and the box spring or along the wall along the you know baseboards of the bedroom um in cracks in the floor if you have a wood floor that has cracks uh, between the, the slats that's you know that's one of their favorite places they crawl into electrical outlets you know if they're not called up well and sealed um so yeah basically any little crack and crevice that's big enough for a bed bug to sit in that's where they'll still <laughs> fair hide. fair enough and when when a human gets bit um i'm pretty sure it's not like the reaction your skin will have from a mosquito or a bee but what 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 do you get just a little redness is it itch like hell i mean what's the side yeah effect? typically you know because they they inject a, a kind of a I don't know what you would call it, like an irritant, a, anesthetic, almost yeah. basically that um, you know that kill, kills or that you know desensitizes the nerves, so that so that you basically don't feel the bite when it's happening, um, and then afterwards is what you know you'll typically have 
some kind of a skin reaction, and it, it varies from person to person, just like it does with mosquitoes. You know, my wife just gets massive welts whenever she gets bitten by mosquitoes, and I hardly ever get any reaction at all. Um, it just depends on the individual. You know, some people can have severe allergic reactions to bed bug bites, and other people might not have any reaction at all, other than a couple of little red spots. Now, one of the things that I've learned about bed bugs over the years that I've been studying them, for reasons I won't bore you with, but um, they really don't like the daylight, is that, and, and they hide. Um, uh, what are ways that we get rid of them? Yeah, so that's the tricky part, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, of course, the first thing most people would do is get a can of Raid and spray all around the bed and the bed frame and the bedroom, um, but that really isn't going to work all that well, usually. Um, for one, a lot of bed bugs are um, resistant. They've developed resistant to a lot of the common household pesticides. Wow. Um, and so that, you know, you just can't kill them with this stuff anymore. Um, <clears throat> for another, they have to be in contact with the insecticide in order for it actually to kill them. And if they're hiding, um, then often you won't get them. So basically what I recommend is just basic household cleanliness just try to to vacuum you know and all those little cracks and crevices uh, make sure you launder your your bedding regularly uh, make sure when you do vacuum that you vacuum in around the bed frame um in you know the box spring um try to try to do a good job you know and when you launder you know, especially if you do have an infestation, you should try to dry the bedding at high temperature. You know they need to; um, they they can't survive temperatures more than about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And so, a typical clothes dryer would would work fine to kill any bed bug eggs or um, adults or nymphs, um, but um, but then you still have to worry about the ones that are that are left, you know, the right. spots that you missed. And so typically you have to repeat this multiple times before you actually get rid of them. What do you think of using a product called diatomaceous earth? Well, so that's uh, basically what that does is that um, abrades the cuticle. Um, and it can work in, in certain conditions, but again, it has to be in contact with their exoskeleton in order to, to have any effect. Um, and so I'm not sure, uh, you know, I've heard various stories about how well or how not well that, that particular um, product actually works on bed bugs. Okay. Um, I, I would say just basically the... The basic cleaning and, and vacuuming is, is what's going to do the trick in most cases. Very good. Um, if you've got a really severe infestation, you might just want to consider replacing your bed um, and then put put it in a different room for, for a time while the room that had the bed bug infestation can be um, vacuumed several additional times because basically what... What happens is you have to get all the different life stages, and because all the different life stages are typically present at the same time, um, you know, you might get the adults and nymphs the first time that you vacuum, but you're not going to get the eggs because they're glued down in the uh, cracks and crevices, yeah. and um, until they hatch, you're not going to be able to get them. How, how far can so they? How wait, far can they go? Know, wait for a week or two and then try, sure. try vacuuming again. How far can they go? Well, they they do travel. I mean, they they can they can move pretty quickly when they want to. So yeah, they. I mean, basically they're they're going to kind of try to set up shop wherever um, their hosts are most reliably present, and typically that's in a bedroom. 
yeah. near a bed. Um, you know, they're they're not going to move too far away from where they can reliably find a host. Um, so this right. is this is one things happen that happens with um, the related bat bugs and bird bugs. Sometimes you know if you get bats nesting in your attic or or birds, you know, like uh, chimney swifts. Uh, sometimes if you have those kind of critters in the house and then something happens and the, there's a there's a bat or bird bug population and the, the hosts disappear, those bugs will actually sort of spread out and disperse and try to find a new host. Um, but because those, those particular species are really dependent on their... Um, bird or bat hosts, um, they, they won't stick around very long. You know, they might they might bite humans occasionally, but they're not going to be able to complete their life cycle and, and build up the population with, with just the human host. Very nice. Are there so, any other things? The, bird, the bed bugs are different. They're, they're adapted. They're, you know, they're to, they've, yeah, uh, adapted to, humans. to human hosts, and so... Um, they're going to be the ones that are sticking around in the house and um, they move around very easily. They disperse uh, mostly through human activity. Um, People packing them in luggage, for example, is probably the the biggest cause of bed bug uh, spread around the world. Um, And you just don't notice it because they're so small and, um, that you know that that's why that's why they're a problem. Very good. Are there any other things about bed bugs that I didn't ask you that you think maybe the listeners should know about them? Yeah, I guess one of the things that I get asked a lot is whether they spread disease, whether they're you know whether they can yeah. cause uh, disease, and and so far the answer is no. Um, there haven't been any uh, credible reports of bed bugs actually spreading human viruses or other other pathogens so that's one good thing about them they're they're kind of a nuisance um, but they're not going to make you sick unless you have to be allergic to their their bites very good well chris thank you so much for your time i greatly appreciate it and and you tried to tell me you didn't know much about bed bugs and you had lots of information for us so that's great okay well you're welcome Thank you very much. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. I want to take a few minutes to follow up on things I talked uh, with Chris Dietrich about. And, of course, he was the one that got volunteered uh, by the entomology department at the University of Illinois in the Illinois Natural History Survey to talk to me about bed bugs. And I think he knew a lot more than, than he thought he did because... Uh, uh, we learned a lot of important things, and I do appreciate his time. Uh, what I want to do now is spend, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes on how to kill the fuckers. <laughs> uh, so if you're fascinated by this, great. Um, if you really don't give two shits and you already heard more and you're creeped the fuck out about Ben Bugs, <laughs> skip ahead a few minutes. Uh, I, I will understand. Um, I happen to have, uh, I don't, I don't want to give too much information, someone that I know. Uh, no, it is not me or my wife or kids. We're fine. It's not my parents. They've passed away, sadly. But um, I have battled with bed bugs and won. So I want to share some tips and ideas of things that you can do to help get rid of bed bugs. Yeah, again, if it's not something you're interested in, skip forward. But uh, hopefully I, uh, someone uh, will find some of the information beneficial. One of the first thoughts that I had is that It is not about lifestyle or necessarily how clean your environment is. Um, So it often has this kind of stereotypical thing that it kind of brought it on yourself for not keeping things clean. Uh, As Chris had mentioned, often they travel in suitcases and luggage. And so one of the first things you should do to not get bed bugs is assuming we're past COVID and you can travel somewhere... Never put any of your luggage on the bed or on the floor next to the bed. You want to be as far as possible. 
If they have a luggage stand, that's way better. Uh, the a dresser that maybe has a TV, if you can put your suitcase up there or on a table or a little coffee table or end table on the other side of the room, uh, that's a really big help. Now, if you like to have a lot of clothes on when you're sleeping, that might be a problem because after they bite you, they may not want to go far and you can carry them back home that way as well. So do you want to sleep in the nude? Fine. That's up to you. Um, other things uh, in your house or in this hotel room or wherever you go and stay, um, you can easily check. And the key thing you want to do is, uh, one of the things I like to do is pull up the fitted sheet, not not the top sheet that lays on top of you, but the sheet under you that usually has a little bit of a spring or <laughs> elastic in the corners to stay around the bed. Lift that up and invert it. And so you want to look inside. They love to hide there. And that would be a good place to find them. Uh, also pulling the bed away from the wall or the headboard. Uh, you might find them and they get disturbed. If you have a lot of light on, they might run away. Uh, the other thing, especially on anything that's a very light colored fabric, uh, bed bugs leave little brown spots, which is bed bug poop. And so if you flip over the fitted sheet and don't see any creatures, but you see lots of little spots somewhere, that's a problem. So that, that's some of the things that you can look for if you're moving around. Now, if you have bed bugs, uh, there's a lot of things that you can do to make the process easier. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of these things. Uh, the first one, which you may not have ever thought of, but you want to make sure that you are sleeping only in one place. You want to avoid falling asleep on your couch and then moving to your bed. You don't want to fall asleep in your lazy boy or recliner or a beanbag chair and then go to bed. You don't want to sleep in this bedroom and then that bedroom. Because if they are living in multiple places, that is multiple locations that you have to kill them. They generally don't come out during daylight. So you're pretty okay. Unless, I mean, if it's a really bad infestation, uh, I have seen a recliner, a lazy boy kind of chair that literally at first glance, it looks like it's a reddish brown fabric in some spots until you realize it's moving. So when there's a lot, a lot, a lot of them and they have to fight for the food supply, they will bite you in the day. So things to look for. Uh, another thing is the place where you sleep. Ideally, it's a room with a hard floor. Uh, wood is okay if it's very tightly put together. But again, uh, they can kind of, I don't know if they chew or claw, but they can make a little little pocket to hide in. So wood's not the best. Uh, ideally, uh, tile, ceramic tile, good grout, no gaps, no spaces, nothing that they can get into. So you, that that's ideal. You want to get as close to that a concrete slab <laughs> under your bed. Uh, if your house has a concrete slab or something, uh, that's one thing you can do. Uh, the other thing is the more often you wash your linens, the better. Every day would be ideal. That's a lot of work. Depends on how bad your infestation is. Um, also, if for a bed, you do not want a conventional uh, fabric spring kind of bed because there's a lot of places they can go, a lot of stitching, a lot of corners, a lot of nooks and crannies. Uh, if there's any openings, you know, even where a needle went in to, to seam it together, if they can crawl inside, they'll hide there and then come outside during the night to come find you. Uh, so I strongly recommend a uh, memory foam bed because there's nowhere for them to go. They can sit on the foam, but they can't get in it. Uh, the additional thing, of course, is memory foam beds have become quite amazing and they're very good and they're very affordable. So if you lose round one of your battle, you can do, like Chris had mentioned, uh, dispose of your bedding and buy a new bed. And then on that bed, I strongly recommend what's called a bed bug encasement. And this is kind of a heavy-duty, tight-knit uh, material. Uh, sometimes they're kind of plasticky, which can drive people nuts. But if you pay 5 or 10 bucks more, you can get a, quite a good one. And bed bugs can crawl around on it with ease and find each other and party and, and poop and lay eggs. Um, but they can't get 
inside of it. Uh, so that's a perk. And of course, you can take it off of the memory foam mattress and wash it in as hot as a water that you can get. Uh, bed bugs can swim quite well, but uh, they can't swim forever. The hot water can kill them. And soap detergent in your laundry actually reduces the surface tension of water, which is what it's supposed to do because that's what helps you clean. That makes it hard for any insect and, and bed bugs in particular to swim and stay where they can get oxygen because without oxygen, they die. And so water with detergent in it, it's much harder for them to stay on the surface and they sink within the water and they basically drown. And that's cool. <laughs> I want bed bugs to drown. And like Chris said, when you put it in the dryer, you want to bake the shit out of it. So you only want to wear clothes or use bedding materials that you can cook the fuck out of it. Do not put it out to hang dry. Do not move it from one room to another. Uh, you want it where when you're pulling the stuff out of the dryer, it is too hot to touch. And you may worry about your linen sh shrinking and being ruined. Well, if that's the case, go buy some $10 sheets at Walmart uh, because you can buy four or five different sets, change them every day, launder them every day, cook the fuck out of them. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Uh, another thing that is really good at killing bed bugs, again, with the heat, if you aren't sure where they've gotten to, uh, you can pack up uh, a, a black trash bag full of clothes from your closet or dresser or that pile that you had on the floor. You got to get rid of all that shit. All those clothes, if you are living in an environment that's relatively warm, you can put those black bags out on your lawn and they'll bake in the summer, but you might have to do that several days in a row. The ideal situation is inside of a car that's in the sun. Uh, a day or two in that condition uh, nothing, nothing, probably nothing, anything will be alive inside of those black bags, inside of your car at extreme high temperatures with the summer sun. Uh, some companies that come in to kill bed bugs will intentionally heat your living environment and they may have to do that for 10, 12, or even 24 hours so that the heat permeates all of the furniture, uh, the bed, the walls, everything, and... That's, oh, I don't recall if it's 140 or 150 degrees, but it's pretty fucking hot. Uh, so you don't want to be in that environment. You want professionals to do that. Uh, I've seen on the internet where you can buy uh, a chamber to put things in to heat it up. Again, that's pretty hot. I would worry about fire hazard, but it, it does work. So you can freeze them. Um, if you freeze them, you want to make sure that they are below freezing for three to four days. That will kill every life cycle. So you could put clothes in a giant chest freezer and some out in your car. Uh, if you live somewhere where it's cold enough, you could put all your clothes just in your backyard in a big snowbank and leave it there for several days. It will kill them uh, that way. Uh, one of the things Chris mentioned is that they like to climb in a tight spaces. So um, a footer around your wall uh, may look beautiful, but if there's little cracks between the wall or the floor and that piece of wood trim, that's a place where they're going to go. And that's one of the places that might be really hard for you to vacuum them up. Oh, by the way, he did say this, but you want to vacuum that tile floor as often as you can. A couple times a day. It doesn't matter. If you are using a container or even better, a HEPA filter bag or uh, even an old vacuum with a bag, as soon as you get done vacuuming, you want to very carefully take the bag out, put it in your trash in the kitchen or dining room or wherever you have your trash can, close up that trash bag and get it outside as fast as possible so that nobody has a chance to escape from your vacuuming. Um, the bed bug encasements that I have used are very bright white. The one problem you can have with that is that the eggs are also very, very white. You will not see the eggs on the bed bug encasement, but any um, any life stage after egg, you, you will see them. Uh, it'll be a black spot and it'll move. Uh, it might sit still and hunker down. Uh, you can take a pen or a pencil and touch it and it'll, it'll wiggle a little bit. Uh, so I like that. And of course, the memory foam bed, uh, once you put the new encasement on, you can treat it. And we touched on it and he 
Chris didn't know a whole lot about diatonaceous earth, so I didn't want to go into that. For me, that's the magic, diatonaceous earth. So I take that foam mattress and I use a, uh, uh, I don't know what the machine is called. It's just a little little hand pump that pumps out diatonaceous earth. Diatonaceous earth is not earth. Uh, it is the exoskeleton remains of creatures that lived 60, 50, 100 million years ago. Uh, kind of like fossilized exoskeletons of ancient insects. And it has characteristics that are really cool. One of them is that you can eat the shit. It's totally fine for a human. It's totally fine for a cat or a dog. Maybe even a mouse, snake. I, I don't know whatever animals you have. Use with caution. But for insects, it just fucks them up. So a couple of things that diatonaceous earth has. It It is a very, very sharp but on a very, very small scale. So you'll never feel it, but an insect will feel it. It also has a bad habit of attaching itself to the legs of insects. Um, kind of like a, a, a burr. You know, if you walk through the forest, you might get a burr on your socks or your pants uh, and they're really hard to get off. Diatonaceous earth has that characteristic with respect to insects. Um, the next thing that is a, a fun characteristic is because it's so sharp, and bed bugs, like most insects, all insects, I'm going to get ahead of myself here, uh, but bed bugs do breathe oxygen and they have little teeny tubes that allow oxygen into their lungs. If the diatonaceous earth gets in there, it will lacerate the breathing tubes and their lungs. And so they can uh, drown basically in their own blood. Uh, the other thing is that if it's on their exoskeleton it can get between the pieces of the armor and cause cause grinding and lacerations and bleeding and it's uh diatonaceous earth is also oh i think i have the right word hydrophilic it loves water and with any insect that it's attached to it can actually kind of wick out all of the moisture from the insect and you get a little bed bug beef jerky uh, so there's different ways that that stuff works. And again, since it's food safe, you actually buy it. It's food grade quality. It's used in uh, warehouses and uh, other places where food is stored because it's perfectly safe for humans, but bad for insects. So it's very useful and it's cheap. You can buy a five, 10 pound bag. I don't know, $10. It's next to nothing. Uh, the other thing that I did for the person I was helping is that we bought a different bed because a conventional frame with wood slats is a fucking nightmare because where the wood sits on the metal frame, they will crawl between or under or kind of notch out. I don't know if, again, like I said, I don't know if they dig, but they love that environment right where the wood meets the metal and they'll hide out. They'll find each other. So you don't want that. I found on Amazon, a all metal frame, uh, square legs, cross supports, uh, and the higher off the floor the bed frame can get your mattress, the better because you don't want them to be able to get to you because they will sniff out your carbon dioxide and crawl up from the floor up your bed. So wood bed posts, uh, any fabric, you can't allow any fabric that's on your bed to ever reach the floor because you've defeated the purpose. They'll climb up the fabric. So you want as this much celebration, uh, celebration, <laughs> separation as possible between the floor and the walls uh, as you can get with your bed. If that means you need a smaller bed for a while, that's fine because it will actually be able to find them, restrict them, kill them if the area is smaller. Maybe a side room in your basement. You go stay down there for a couple of months and everyone that was alive in your room, uh, you've either vacuumed up killed with diatonaceous earth or they starve to death because you're not there to eat uh other things oh this bed frame that i got uh any part that was a tube i would spray diatonaceous earth within that component and then anywhere there was a gap to get in or out of any spaces or almost every place where there was a connection i put caulk just regular old fucking white household caulk that you might use uh, at the edge of your tub where the tile is, you know, between the tile and the bathtub caulk. Uh, I did a lot of research and watched 
I don't know, a hundred different videos on YouTube. And so I'm kind of throwing all this together. They apparently don't like to walk on caulk. They can, and if they will, they have to, but for some reason, they just don't fucking like it. So you can restrict their movement and they're less likely to find a friend and mate and lay eggs if they can't find each other. Uh, the other nice thing is that if and when they're near the caulk, they lay uh, a little bed bug poop, you can find that and see that because it's on a bright white caulk, just like uh, the foam bed in the bright white encasement. Um, what I also then do is I stick all of the legs for the bed uh, inside of cups. And I found a thing called climb ups, which is basically a little plastic thing with multiple rings and the leg of the bed, hopefully it's small leg sits in the middle of the climb up and the bed bugs can climb up to get into, I guess the moat area and in the moat area and where the legs itself sits, uh, there's diatomaceous earth also. So if they get in there and slip and the, the material is a, a special kind of hard plastic that bed bugs apparently have a very hard time climbing and their idea originally was they'll get trapped there and just die. Uh, I'm not okay them getting trapped and eventually dying. <laughs> I want them to die quickly. So that's why I have the diatomaceous earth in there to fuck with them. Uh, I also use either a red solo cup or your classical styrofoam coffee cup. So I'll have the climb up, the cup, and then the leg inside the cup. And it turns out red solo cups bed bugs have a really, really, really hard time climbing up. So if they're on your floor, they've got to get into the climb up, the thing called the climb up. They've got to go through the diatomaceous earth once, twice. They've got to get to the cup. They've got to climb up four or five inches up a red solo cup. And when they get to the other side, they fall back down. And of course, guess what's at the bottom? Another dusting of diatomaceous earth. And then they've got to start their climb up. And so all of it is to make it harder, harder, harder for them to figure out and how to climb up to the CO2. Uh, the other thing that I found was absolutely fascinating is packing tape. Packing tape. Yes, the uh, you can't have any reinforcing fibers in it, but just the clear old-fashioned tape that you would put on a box to ship it across the country. Clear packing tape. I put this on the legs of the bed. Now, you might be thinking to have the sticky part out because they get stuck on it. N does not work. They walk right over that shit. They can do it all day. They never get stuck. It's not like a fly in glue paper. They walk over the sticky part. What they can't do is walk over the outside, the part that you would normally be able to touch after you've taped a box. To them, for whatever reason, it is slippery as fuck and they can't do it. So they uh, may be able to climb up the legs of these beds the bed that I, the frame that I used, even though it's hard because it's a very hard steel with a shiny polish on it, but they can, if they can climb it, when they get to that tape and again, sticky side on the leg and the clean, smooth side on the outside, they can never fucking cross it. So they can't actually get up to you. So there's just block after block after block. Oh, by the way, I, I, I put diatomaceous earth over the entire floor. Uh, and so if any of them fall off your clothes or fall off you when you get up in the morning, they land in diatomaceous earth. So there's step after step after step where they don't want to be, they don't want to go, uh, it kills them. Uh, the horizontal parts of the bed, uh, again, more uh, clear packing tape. So if they try to move from the left side to the right side of the bed underneath, they can't do it. Now, if they turn over and use the fabric, they can walk in the fabric upside down from one side to another. But if they ever try to walk around uh, the tape, they fall off again onto the toxic floor. It's kind of like the game of lava. Uh, once you have all that set up, of course, we have the mat, the foam mattress with the encasement on it. I then put on a fitted sheet and I will, once I put on the fitted sheet, I will lift up each corner and use uh, a dust sprayer. God, I wish I knew the word for it. Uh, if you have this problem, and can't figure out what I'm talking about. Let me know. Uh, and I'll send you a picture on Amazon. It's just a couple of dollars. And you put the diatomaceous earth in there and it's this big pump that, well, not big, three or four inches uh, around, something like you might use to push air into a, a furnace to uh, uh, meld steel, a uh, bend steel. Uh, and so I put a puff under each corner of the fitted sheet. So 
if the bed bugs try to come climb under the fitted sheet between the fitted sheet and the bed bug encasement, there's more powder. So that's going to get them. And then when you put on the conventional top sheet, uh, whether you tuck that in or not, it's probably best to not tuck it in. But again, I lift that up and spray. So you have diatomaceous earth powder on the fitted, on top of the fitted sheet that you're laying on top of. Again, totally human safe, but you want them to walk through it, uh, ingest it, breathe it in, t- touch it, whatever. Uh, and then, of course, if you have extra sheets, you want to make sure between each layer you put diatomaceous earth. Again, the faster you change the sheets and the hotter you cook them, the more you're going to kill and the faster your problem is going to go away. But you may have to launder every single fucking piece of fabric that you have. And if you don't do these things, if you have a conventional box spring with a conventional mattress on it and you don't change the sheets and it's in a room with a carpet and it's close to the floor and your blankets touch the floor and you've got clothes laying around on the floor all around the room, you are never ever, ever going to get rid of bed bugs. So one one location to sleep, the smallest bed you can handle out of foam, uh, bed bug encasements, diatomaceous earth, layers of tricks and traps for the, the, any bed bugs that get into your room to go up. Uh, Also the trim around your, your floorboard, Uh, seal that, caulk that, do whatever you have to do is to make sure no bed bugs can get in and out. Uh, He also, Chris, uh, my guest mentioned and I'm so delighted that he did outlets, uh, coaxial connections, phone connections, conventional outlets. They can move from room to room via an outlet. You either want to cap them or put in uh, a little piece of foam meant to block uh, airflow between rooms or from an outside wall or put professional foam in there that seals it all up so they can't get through. Um, God, I think that's I think that's most of it. And, and I call that system the bed bug deathbed because the person that I was helping had it bad. Uh, if I gave you all the details, you might get nauseated. It was bad. It took us a few months, but we finally got to the point where we would find one or two for a while and then find nothing. And depending on where you live, and this person happens to live in a multi-unit housing environment, you can never really know that they're gone. I mean, if it's your house, you can eventually get to that point. But in an apartment building or condos, um, some people don't really feel the bed bug bites and they're not that bothered by them. I fucking loathe them. Um, but so they might come back. They might crawl down the hallway and get into your place again. So way more than you ever wanted to know about bed bugs Uh, Hopefully you found that educational, interesting. You learned something new and I'm going to wrap up more than enough about that. And uh, I'll talk to you later. I really don't have much to say to wrap up this episode, which may surprise virtually anyone who knows me that I don't have much to say at this point. Uh, Hopefully you found that very valuable, informative, educational, maybe a little entertaining. And again, if you have bed bugs, hopefully that helps you an awful lot. They are not something you want to have and hopefully you never get them. And if you get them now, you have some better ways and ideas of how to combat them. It can be done. Um, The case that I worked on, we went from someone getting dozens and dozens of bites per day uh, to next to nothing, virtually zero, uh, because of their living arrangement, it will be an ongoing struggle to get to zero, but it is a huge improvement. So that's really all I've got today because it's all focused on this bed bug thing. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed. If you want to, uh, support the show, you of course can leave a five-star review. You can share this episode with someone that might be interested in this topic Uh, You can go sign up at patreon.com slash Phil and become a patron. All those things are very nice, and I would appreciate it greatly. I'm going to wrap up and get back to normal shows uh, in the next episode, and I hope to see you out there in the world sometime soon. Until then, ciao. Ciao.